so my involvement there has been with FirstNet. Uh, you're aware that they're building out a nationwide public safety broadband network, and uh, they've been working diligently on data collection uh, to collect it, as much data as they could possibly collect from all of the state's public safety entities. So the, all that uh, information uh, was due September 30th, so we've completed that. It's been turned into FirstNet, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today and FirstNet's timeline, and then uh, our executive director, Steve Proctor, is going to talk to you a bit about uh, LMR radio and, and, and LTE technologies and the differences between. And, uh, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, just uh, introductions are done, I guess. So uh, <coughs> this is just a quick slide on the data collection. We uh, put out uh, requests to all the public safety entities in Utah, within Utah. We have about 680. And out of those, we had 98 surveys that were completed representing about 14% of the public safety entities in Utah. And if you look at the, the stat for the country, there's over 96,621 uh, public safety entities in the country, and there was a 3,736 surveys completed for about 4%. So there's still a lot of work to do with data collection. Um, so far to this point, the data collection will be used by FirstNet in their development of their RFP. They're working on that now. They're taking in examining all this data and, and compiling it into their, their uh, RFP that uh, they're planning on releasing later this year. So we're going to continue data collection. They want us to keep doing that through the rest of the next year. That data that we collect won't go into the RFP, but it will go into the state plans, which are, are coming. Um, part, of the, part of the data collection um, was our, they, they, they gave us a, an, a, a map of their objective coverages, our coverage objectives, um, what they thought the coverage needs in Utah were just by the data that they had collected and what they had used is uh, the public safety user density, uh, high risks of influence and some things that are listed here. Uh, important to FirstNet but not listed in the baseline were state level detail which they asked us to do. They wanted us to improve on this because they realized that, that this doesn't really depict what the broadband coverage needs in Utah are. So we worked with our AGRC group, our Automated Graph uh, Geographic uh, Resource Center, and uh, they developed uh, through a series of platforms a, a much better uh, objective coverage map. And this is what FirstNet had given us in their, in their baseline projection. And you can see that the red areas are where they say the most need is for broadband, where you'd see you know, the most 911 calls, the most traveled roads, things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of areas in the green there, which is the low priority that we really do have high priority in those areas. There's, there's a lot of areas that would not be represented in this, in this coverage map. So uh, just a point in case here, uh, this is from their uh, baseline coverage. And Bert right here just walked in. He's uh, from AGRC. He's the one that helped us to develop this. Welcome, Bert. Uh, this, uh, you can see that two uh, major ski areas in Utah weren't represented in the baseline coverage, and there's obviously a lot of high volume there, a lot of people there, uh, a lot of possibility for uh, call-outs for help. Uh, you can see here he circled uh, U.S. Highway 6 as a low priority. Uh, if any of you know Highway 6, it's, it goes between Provo and, and, uh, and uh, Price. A lot of traffic there, a lot of big trucks going up and down that road. Several years ago, we had a very big uh, explosion there that uh, caused a lot of damage, hurt some people. Uh, communications was pretty poor there. That was one of the uh, negatives in the after action report. So that really is a, a, an area of higher priority than what they represented here. So, uh, so for our coverage considerations, our EGRC folks looked at population density, uh, address properties, transportation, major roads. I'm sorry, Bert, can you tell me what AADT is? That's the traffic volume, okay. I didn't understand, I didn't know what that was, sorry. Uh, wireless 911 calls uh, in, in, around the state, uh, where, where they all came from. And uh, high risk areas of influence, like where, where uh, the major, most of the police and, and fire and EMS folks are, our schools, our correction facilities, um, recreation areas where we recreate. Those are, all those areas were pretty much left out of the baseline coverage maps. And our new, our new baseline that we have, uh, our new co uh, uh, coverage objective represents those areas. And here's some of the things that uh, AGRC came up with. 
These are some maps here of the major roadways that are traveled in Utah and the traffic volumes that are on those, uh, where all of our schools and, and emergency facilities are located. These are all put into each of the levels that they, that they used to build our, our coverage uh, proposal. Uh, this here shows address properties. They were all added into the, 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 to the new uh, coverage objective. And this here is, uh, is uh, you can see all the wireless 911 calls. And you can see most of them come from, you know, between Ogden and, and Provo. But there's a lot down the I-15 corridor and uh, a lot of calls out in the rural areas of Utah where people are recreating, they're playing, you know, people get hurt out there. So they, they were important. Uh, a lot of calls from down in the Cedar St. George area. Um, uh, these are some other things that were used, agricultural, uh, energy, those industries were included in uh, phase five of, of our coverage objective. Um, and this is a comparison of the two maps. The one on, the, on your left here is, is FirstNet's baseline and the one on the right is, is what we came up with. You can see there's a lot more priority coverage. The red is phase one. FirstNet asked us to um, come up with five phases of build out for building the radio access network here in Utah. So our phase one is in red, phase two is in orange. You can see there are roadways that connect the county seats and, and different things, and then it moves on out to, into the rural Utah. One thing that you should understand is even though rural Utah is in the, the later phases, FirstNet is mandated by the law to, uh, to address certain rural milestones. Now those haven't been developed yet, they're still working on those, but during each of their phases of their build out, they have to address rural milestones so that we're not leaving rural Utah out in the cold on this. Um, some of the next steps that we have for, for our mapping is we'll work with FirstNet. They're going to call and uh, we're going to have calls. They're, they're, they're planning on calling all the states between October 19th and November 3rd to review the data that we submitted. So we'll work with them to review that, uh, update anything that they need updates on. We're going to continue, like I said, gathering data and we'll get that to FirstNet. It won't go in the RFP, like I said, but it will go into the state plans. And then uh, outreach and feedback. And you can see here this web application at firstnet.utah.gov, um, there's a, a, a mapping tool that uh, AGRC has created there that you can actually go in and, and modify that map. You could, it's, it's an interactive map. You can go in and draw polygons on it and mark it up and say, I, the coverage you say here isn't representative of what I think it is, and you can tell us why. And then FirstNet can use that to adjust their, the, the, the coverage objectives that we have already listed here. And then we'll just work with FirstNet on any uh, future directives that they put out for us to, to work on. And again, this is just a, a coverage, our, our objective coverage. Does anybody have any questions at this point on any, any of this so far? Okay. So FirstNet um, has some early builders. There's five of them in the country. We have one in LA Ricks in Los Angeles, California, New Mexico, Adams, uh, Adams County, Colorado, one in uh, Harris, Texas, and another one in New Jersey. They've all leased uh, band 14 bandwidth spectrum from FirstNet, and they're building out uh, broadband networks on band 14 in, in, their, in their counties. LA Ricks isn't online yet. They're planning on having their system online for the Rose uh, Parade in January. Uh, New Mexico has uh, several sites that are online and working. Adams County, Colorado, I believe, has uh, 16 sites that are up and running. Uh, they're planning three more at the airport in Denver that um, they're waiting. They're, I think they're pretty much ready. They're just waiting for some power to be brought into the equipment. Uh, Harris, Texas, has 19 sites that are active. Uh, they're planning 92, uh, but right now they've got 19 sites that are up and running. New Jersey has three subnets that they have up and running. And we were just in uh, Colorado last week at the single point of contact meeting that we had there and each of these five early builders reported out on uh, on their on their systems and one of the things that they brought out to just a, a case in point you know they're they're at a football game and one of the things that they had a really hard time with is people lose their children in those those games right there's there's a lot of people running around kids get lost and it was very difficult for them to, to locate their children uh, the uh, authorities there would want to send out a text with a picture of the child and the system was overloaded, they couldn't do it. Those that have some of the band 14 system up and running, they've been able to 
do that much more quickly. They, they, were, they, they, they said it was unbelievably faster to relocate a child with its, with its parents uh, on this system because it's not being used by the public and it's not being overloaded. They have the bandwidth that they need to do what they need to do. One, one of the big benefits of uh, having this dedicated public safety network. So on a timeline for FirstNet, like I said, we, we just completed the data collection September 30th. Uh, right now, <coughs> uh, they'll be, they're working on the RFP. They're going to take all these data collection elements and other things and, and take the draft RP, RFP and, and, and finalize it. And they're, gonna, they're planning on releasing it uh, around December 31st of this year. Uh, after that point, they're uh, asking for the questions from the proposers to be in by February of 2016. They plan on answering all those questions by March. And then by May, they want all the proposals in from, from the vendors. And then continuing on with, uh, with their timeline, uh, after that point, at some point, they don't have a date when the award will be made, but they'll make the award. And during this whole process, they're starting a second round of state consultations. They've, they've done a first round of state uh, consultations with almost every state. They've got four or five left. They plan on having those done by the end of this year. And then through the whole process of next year, at all of 2016, they're going to be consulting with the states again. And the discussion there will be the state plans. They're going to talk about the elements that will go into the state plans uh, and get those state plans prepared. Once the award's made, then they'll be able to finalize those plans, and then they'll be given to the states. At that point, we will have to take that, uh, that plan and review it uh, and prepare it to give to the governor. And uh, once the governor has that plan, he has 90 days to make a decision to opt in or opt out of FirstNet's plan. And what that means is he, he either opts in and accepts FirstNet's plan and they'll come in and build the radio access network here in Utah. And uh, I didn't explain that, but FirstNet's building a core network that's going to cover the country, their core, there'll be one single core for the whole country. And then each state will have to build their own uh, radio access network that will access the core. And the, the plan is for FirstNet to build it. They want to come in, they want to build the, the network. But they're giving the states the option to say, we don't want you to build it, we want to build it. So basically the governor, if he opts in, FirstNet will come in and build it. If he opts out, then at that point the state's going to be responsible. Uh, and at, that starts another clock. The governor will then have 180 days to put together a plan to build out the network here in, in, in the state. Uh, that plan then has to be given to the FCC and be approved. Uh, and to be approved, it's going to have to meet all the criteria that FirstNet's plan did. So it's going to have to be interoperable with FirstNet, have to, have to meet all their technical criteria. If, if it, by chance, meets that criteria and, and the state is granted the right to build their own network. At that point, they can go and apply to NTIA for a grant to build the network. And that will come at a cost to the state. Typically, federal grants come with a 20% match. So there'll be some uh, monetary uh, responsibility by the states there if they decide to build their own network. And at that point, they, if their plan's approved, they get the grant funding, they build it. They will have to build it. They'll have to own it, maintain it, refresh it. All the new, when the new technology comes around, they'll have to take care of all that at their expense. And then they also have to lease spectrum from the band 14 spectrum from FirstNet. They, we don't own the spectrum, FirstNet does, so they would have to lease that from, uh, from FirstNet. So a lot of responsibility put on the shoulder of the state if they decide to opt in and build their own. One thing to note is that states were talking early on about uh, some of the states that are bigger states that would have more users and generate more revenue than they, than they would need to operate their system were wanting to generate that revenue and put it into their state coffers and, and use it for their state funding. In FirstNet's uh, second public announcement, and just here in October, they approved this, that they, they, they're, only, they're, they're not going to allow the states to do that. The, the, the revenues that they generate, they can generate enough revenues to cover the cost of the network, uh, to maintain it, to build it, to refresh it, all that. But anything over and above that, they have to turn back into FirstNet, and that money will be put back into the system to, to upgrade and build out the system. FirstNet was given $7 billion, which is basically seed money to start this network. Uh, it's going to cost four or five times that to build out a nationwide network. So they're, they're going to rely on the extra revenues that they generate to go back in and, and uh, build out the network. So they won't, be allow, uh, they won't allow the states to do that. Um, and that's all I have on FirstNet.
Uh, any, any questions? Okay. We'll turn the time over to Mr. Proctor. He's uh, going to talk to us a bit about uh, public safety uh, communications in Utah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Great, to, grateful to see you out there. Uh, just uh, before starting about what's public safety grade communications, this is a band 14 first net ready device. And this is, this is an early version of what these devices will look at and look like. And uh, I thought I'd pass that around so you can take a look at it. This is a, a hardened device. And this device is built so that you can throw it on the floor. So, uh, sorry, Gordy. I, but if you'd pass it around and let people take a look at that. And, and that device is, is basically a cellular phone, a broadband device, and then it has the band 14 first net spectrum in it that will operate on this nationwide network. So let's talk a minute about public safety grade communications and, and what we're doing here in Utah with respect to uh, this network. Uh, whether you know it or not, there's currently two statewide networks that operate in Utah. One of them operates on VHF or the 150 spectrum. The other operates on the 800 megahertz spectrum. It's a trunked radio network that was installed uh, back by the, uh, uh, the time of the Olympic Games. It supported the Olympic Games and public safety services in there. A public safety network is simply this. It's a network made up of Obviously don't have coverage in this room. Anyway, it's basically police radios. It's narrow band. It's digital or it's analog. It's, uh, it's uh, high powered. These are three watt devices that you see here as opposed to the, the cellular phones that are about six tenths of a watt. The, uh, the service areas for police, fire, EMS, corrections, Department of Natural Resources, Public Works. Uh, the two major prisons in Utah all use these devices for their officers. It's radio to dispatch to 911 to response. Uh, I mentioned the two systems and the connectivity we use is fiber, microwave, and copper. Uh, wh whatever's the most available and whatever's the least expensive over a 10 year time period. Uh, the things that are talked about over this network are chases. Uh, how do we respond to somebody that's in an accident? How do we respond to uh, somebody who's injured? Life flight, how do we get the helicopter in here? Multiple agency responses for all kinds and any kinds of, of uh, incidences. We currently maintain about 200 mountaintops statewide. Uh, there's about 46 911 centers located statewide in many communities in Utah. There are five in Utah County that operate uh, and receive calls. This radio system responds to about 160,000 calls every 24 hours. And if you do the math over a 20 year life cycle, that's a lot of calls. That's people pushing the button a lot. There are about 22,500 of these devices uh, located on, uh, on the network and our 911 system currently processes about three and a half million calls annually. This is a typical public safety site. This one's built out in the West Desert in Tooele County. Uh, there's no power there, so this is solar powered, completely a solar powered facility. The type of conditions that we need to have for these facilities needs to withstand things like this. And if you see that yellow handled, this, this is the tower, this is the uh, solar panels that have been iced over. And when that happens, there's a backup generator up there that automatically takes over. And you can see a shovel stuck in the side of the tower. That's the type of, of conditions these systems operate in every winter, all winter long, 24, 65, three, or 24, 7, 365. To construct these facilities, there are uh, a multiple number of devices we use. Uh, Obviously, these helicopters help haul cement and, uh, 
uh, and the tower steel to the top of the mountains and uh, help us construct the facilities. Uh, in many cases, if there's a facility there, we try and rent space there, we try and share space, we try and do the least cost method to get to the objective we need of having services up there. Maintenance is always critical, and as you can see, this is uh, a pretty, ma pretty big maintenance struggle to get the vehicles up there with the, uh, the equipment trailers. Just a couple of slides showing you what the base of a tower looks like. This is, this is the base of a 150-foot galvanized steel tower. And to get the concrete there, the helicopter was a little expensive, so we took 150 bucket loads of cement, one bucket at a time, to the top of the mountain. And then this is a picture of us stacking the, the uh, tower after that's done. And this is what the equipment looks like inside the facilities that we, we put on the mountain. That's a 20-channel ch simulcast site supporting these, these two uh, technologies, their public safety radio. This is a building. We assemble these buildings down in our local yard and then truck them up to the site and haul them in place. This is a uh, public safety dispatch center. This is one position in about a 30 position center. Uh, maybe a police dispatcher, maybe a fire dispatcher. When you dial 911, this is who answers. This is who gives pre-arrival instructions. This is who dispatches the first, uh, first responder to the scene that you're, you're located at or your family member may need. And then these are the people we serve. And they don't care what the brand is. They don't care how it's networked together. They don't care who put it in. They don't care what it says on the front of the radio. They just care that it works every time, all the time, uh, in places where it's inconceivable that radio would work. A couple of incidences we've been involved in. This was uh, uh, a big fire that was in uh, central Salt Lake City in about 2004 that burned down a paper plant. Every, every time there's a winter snowstorm, these trucks are all communicating on this, uh, this uh, public safety network. Gordy spoke earlier about an explosion in Spanish Fort Canyon that uh, took out an explosions making plant and literally put a hole in US 50 and 6. This is the type of incidents that we respond to, have to coordinate responses. And then this happened in early 1988 when two airplanes collided over Kearns and fell into a neighborhood. Uh, several public safety responses uh, involved in this situation. Uh, I remember getting there uh, on the response and we did not have the radio network that we have today and marshalling all those responses and putting all that together was impossible back then. This, this system that we've installed has made it so much easier now to, to do that. Gordy talked a lot about FirstNet and the projected broadband coverage that's coming. And that map is over on your right-hand side, my left-hand side. This is the projected coverage of the land mobile radio system that's currently installed today, whether it be VHF or 800 megahertz. That is the goal of any public safety system is to extend the coverage out there that far. And you can see when you compare those to where the population bases are, uh, you have a lot better coverage than you do with the FirstNet network. The FirstNet network will be a great network 10 years down the road, but it's not what's here and now, it's the future. The land mobile radio network will remain the, the key primary response tool for public safety first responders, not just for 10 years or 20 years, but probably for good. The reason is, is these networks are built to a hardened standard. They're, they're built to withstand some of the, the forces, like you saw the snow, the ice, the wind, the rain. At some point in time, that device that you're passing around may have the ability to talk on a public safety network, but it's always gonna be secondary to the police officer that carries one of these uh, because A, they don't have control of it, and B, they don't know how it's maintained, and C, the difference in coverage. Those networks can only be built to where the people are to use them. Uh, the police need to talk to where the people aren't. How many times have we heard about rescues out in the West Desert or rescues in some of the national parks? 
uh, the, the first responders need, need their uh, networks built to cover in those areas. So what does this all mean and why are we here presenting? Uh, you folks are the providers of services in, in your communities and, and in the state of Utah. And, and our goal here is just to simply give you a, a view of the two public safety networks that are, that are in the future. Uh, the UCA, Utah Communications Authority, who we represent, is currently in the process of specking out and building a new radio system. That's the radio system that's going to provide the blue coverage. Uh, the technology we have now is about 20 years old, and we're in the process of specking out a replacement system. Part of that system is the interconnect, the connectivity to the mountaintops, the connectivity between dispatch centers. They're part of the process of developing and delivering those services. There are two RFPs that will first start in an RFI and then, and then turn into an RFP that will be issued uh, over the next couple of weeks, they'll be available on the site's BidSync site that, that you're uh, welcome to look at and respond to. One of the RFP is, is for the radio infrastructure that supports these. The other is for the infrastructure that supports the connectivity. So there's two separate RFPs, one for radio, one for the connectivity. And uh, we'd encourage any and all to take a look at those. Uh, one of the things everybody needs to remember is the connectivity we need is in some pretty far remote places. Difficult to get service there, expensive to plow it into the ground, expensive to build it, expensive to maintain it, but those are the, that's the places we're looking to get our, uh, our network. Uh, again, the future of public safety is probably going to boil down to one of these and one of those devices wherever it is in the room on every public safety first responder. So they have two choices of networks. This one's obviously gonna do the broadband work. This one will do the narrowband voice into the, into the areas. Uh, devices that, that public safety first responders are gonna need is broadband video, body cameras and the ability to take photographs, store photographs and have the data networks in order to, to uh, store all those. I was at a presentation once given by a, a, a police officer that was part of a 50-man police uh, organization in the Midwest. When they sat down and figured out how much storage space and network they needed to store the body cam image, images of 50 officers for one year, it, it was an unbelievable number. It was a data center full of numbers. So there are, there are those issues that are coming down the pike that will be critical to future public safety first responders. The dispatch centers of the future will be the nerve center of distribution of any and all public safety responses. Just think if you can text or send a video or a photograph from your accident scene to a dispatch center to give them better information to dispatch the call in response to you. Where do you store it? How do you disseminate it? How do you respond to the call? What are some of the issues that, that uh, the dispatchers are gonna be have, to, have to be trained on to deal with those issues day in and day out? Uh, as I mentioned, training skills are necessary. The one thing we found over the last uh, 20 years as we built this radio network is this. It used to be that if you went into Davis County and there are 15 agencies in Davis County, each one of them had their own radio system. Each one managed their own network. Each one had their own transmitter sites. Now it's one radio system. They all talk to each other. They all have changed the protocols in which they respond. They all have events channels that allow them to talk together. So they have their own autonomy, their own departmental dispatch center, but they have the ability to communicate everybody together when they have a mutual aid response. If you're on I-15 and happen to drive by a accident or some kind of event, Next time, notice who you see. It isn't just the highway patrol. It's emergency management. It could be life flight. It could be hazardous material skill uh, spills cleanup person. It could be UDOT. It could be a number of agencies. And all those people have to talk together to coordinate the response that saves lives and protects property. Uh, the cost of these networks, Gordy mentioned $7 billion as seed money for the, for the uh, uh, FirstNet network, seven billion dollars. Imagine having seven billion dollars of seed money. Uh, the, uh, 
the anticipated cost of the radio network we we hope to build here in the future over the next uh, 20 years will probably be around $200 million to get coverage into all these areas in Utah. That's a lot of money. And that's the other thing that drives people to, together and, and really centers us on the cost of doing business. Uh, the only thing that really matters as we go through all of this is that we're success successful and that those folks that need these tools have these tools in their hands. As I mentioned earlier, a police officer going 100 miles an hour down the freeway chasing a bank robber doesn't care that it says Motorola or Harris on this radio. He just cares that it works and is easy to work and he doesn't have to change channels as he's driving 100 miles an hour. Those are some of the considerations we need to make in this. This is just a slide to show you the, the first responder car of the future and all the integrated components and electronics that are in this car, from video to photographs to public safety, uh, P25 radio to broadband to digital video recorders to a workstation, automated license re uh, recognition, so you drive up, point at a license plate, and it automatically finds out if that car is stolen or there's a wants and warrants out on it and streaming video so that eventually when an officer pulls out on a stop, the, the dispatch center or headquarters getting streaming video of that call as it's taking place. And then finally, just a, a progressive chart to show you that it all starts at the dispatch center and whatever the response is, whether it be police, fire, transportation, wildlife resources, it goes through these the vehicles through these sites that we have built on remote mountaintop peaks and gets to the people who needs it. Okay, it's question time. We've either put you to sleep or hopefully helped inform you. Just wanted to tell you there are two handouts in the back of the room that you're welcome to take that talk about the differences between LTE, the device you have there, and LMR, and why the two are separate networks and separate uh, response type networks and separate technologies and why public safety is looking at both of those technologies as, uh, as uh, a critical tool for, for the agencies we serve. Questions? budgetary numbers uh, run about 21, 22 million dollars per year. That's for o operations and maintenance and That's debt correct. service. So to expand more broadband services like you've outlined, do you have any, do you have any idea where, where that is at? I'm just talking about narrowband. The broadband piece of this is, is FirstNet. It's a national organization. Uh, uh, uh. So that's the, that's the story we're trying to get across. That these aren't together, these are separate technologies. One's managed by the feds. It's, FirstNet is a federal independent organization that's run by a board of directors under the National Information Telecommunication Administration. So it's two separate networks. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Any others? I just want to give a shout out to Bert too. Uh, a lot of people in this state don't know what automated geographical reference and that organization does. Big deal. Lots of maps, lots of support, lots of data that help make these critical decisions a lot easier and Bert's been very, I'm involved in both the 911 and the radio and Bert's been very instrumental in, in uh, helping us get through that. Thank you Bert. Thank you. And I have your jump drive in my briefcase. I can't believe I just took that yesterday. <laughs> so, any other questions? Thank you, don't forget to grab a handout It hopefully will explain LTE and LMR a little bit. We appreciate your attention and look forward to hopefully working with some of you, thanks.